Hi friends, welcome to my blog ECG Basics. Today we will discuss about the acute Fermi syndrome, uh, which includes uh, ST elevation in my non-ST elevation in my and unstable angina. Uh, before uh, uh, discussing about the acute coronary syndrome, we will just have a look at the uh, blood supply of the heart. So we will uh, discuss about the blood supply in the heart, pathophysiology of the acute coronary syndromes, localization of the myocardial infarction, and uh, uh, what are arrhythmia which occurs during the acute coronary syndrome. So let's discuss about the blood supply of the heart. Uh, as we know that uh, aortic valve has three cusps, right coronary cusp, left coronary cusp, and non-coronary cusp. From right and left uh, coronary cusp, there arises the coronary arteries. And these coronary arteries are right coronary artery and the left coronary artery, uh, which supply the heart. So we have right coronary artery. The right coronary artery this supplies the right atrium and the right ventricle. Uh, in this figure, we, you can see this is the right atrium and this is the uh, right ventricle. Similarly, the left coronary artery, it supplies the left atrium and the left ventricle. The left coronary artery through its branches, that is the left circumflex artery or left anterior descending artery. The left uh, circumflex artery that supplies the left atrium and the left ventricle. And similarly, the left anterior descending artery supplies the right ventricle, left ventricle and the interventricular septum. Left, uh, it also has a left marginal artery that supplies the left ventricle and the right marginal artery that supplies the, this is a branch of right coronary artery that supplies the right ventricle and the apex. Here we see that uh, this is the aortic uh, area, the right coronary artery arises from the right coronary cusp and the left coronary artery arises from the left coronary cusp. If we see the right coronary artery, uh, this uh, right coronary artery gives branch to SNO, AV node and also branch to the aorta and um, encircles the aorta and, it's, and supplies the aorta. The right coronary artery basically divides into acute marginal artery and and it uh, continues. This is the this is right coronary artery and it divides into acute marginal artery and continues posteriorly as the right coronary artery and uh, thereafter it ends as a posterior descending artery. So the right artery, right artery, right coronary artery supplies SNO, AV node, and then uh, it uh, branches to the aorta, and it also gives the acute marginal artery in the right uh, coronary artery that continues posteriorly as posterior descending artery. Similarly, if we see the left main coronary artery, it also gives branch to SNO, AV node and the branches to the aorta, then this left main coronary artery uh, divides into left circumflex artery which goes posteriorly. Before going posteriorly, it gives a obtuse marginal artery, obtuse marginal artery and it goes posteriorly as the posterior descending artery. This uh, left main coronary artery also this branches, um, it continues as a main branch left anterior descending artery and it gives a septal branches like S1, S2 and D1, D2, D3 as diagonal branches. So, the left main coronary artery gives branches to SA node, AV node, branches to the aorta, then it divides into left circumflex and the left anterior descending, left circumflex continues posteriorly and goes in the posterior interventricular group as posterior descending artery and left anterior descending artery continues in the uh, continues and supplies the septal branches like S1, S2 and diagonal branches D1, D2, D3. 
these are the branches of the left anterior descending the septum basically it is supplied by both right coronary artery and the uh, lcx branch of the left anterior descending artery sorry left coronary artery sorry uh, the septum is supplied by both right coronary artery and the left coronary artery and uh, uh, this left uh, coronary artery supplies the septum through its left anterior descending artery if for example if the, as we know that right coronary artery supplies the sa node and uh, it also supplies the av node if there is uh, some blockage in the right coronary artery and uh, means blockage in the artery to sa node or artery to the av node the if uh, block, there is blockage to the artery to the sa node it will cause the atrial arrhythmias and if there is blockage to the branch to av node it will cause the heart blocks uh, next thing is the dominance uh, in the dominance means what is the main no we will say uh, discuss about the dominance basically the dominance Dominance is based on the based on the posterior descending artery. Uh, whichever artery gives rise to posterior uh, descending artery will determine the uh, dominance. Uh, for example, uh, we have seen that more than two third of the patients they have right dominance. That is, the posterior descending artery (PDA) arises from the right coronary artery, and in one third of the patient. Uh, they have left dominance that means the patent, uh, posterior descending artery that arises from the left circumflex artery so means uh, left circumflex is the branch of left coronary artery uh, at times the people show the co dominance that means both patient patients have both rca and the lcx that gives rise to pda okay depending upon the blood supply uh, if we see that if the right coronary artery is occluded that means it's supplied to the sa node av node right ventricle posterior wall of the heart that will be affected so the patient will have sa node block av nodal block uh, right ventricular myocardial infarction and posterior wall mi and similarly on the other hand if left circumflex uh, artery is blocked then patient will have inferior wall mi and the posterior wall mi i will discuss later this topic if a right coronary artery is occluded the most common leads affected will be the inferior leads that is lead 2 lead 3 and avf and whenever the patient presents us to uh, with inferior wall mi the most common occlusion is in the right coronary artery Similarly, if the left anterior descending artery is occluded, the affected leads are V2, V3, and V4. V2, V3, and V4. For right coronary artery, it is 2, 3, and AVF. And if LCX is occluded, then the leads affected are lateral leads. That is, lead one, AVL, V5, and V6. So, whenever the lateral leads are affected. we should think of lcx occlusion if lead b2 b3 b4 are affected think of lad occlusion and if right coronary artery is occluded the affected leads are lead 2 3 and avf uh, this figure depicts our blood supply in the various uh, parts of the heart for example sa node is supplied 60% supplies from the right coronary artery and 40% from the left circumflex artery and for av node 90% means mainly from the right coronary artery and 10% is from the left circumflex artery similarly the right ventral branch is supplied by the septal branch of left anterior descending and often it receives the collaterals from the right coronary artery and the lcx depending on which one is dominant and uh, this bundle is supplied mainly mainly by the right coronary artery but it also has contribution from the septal branches of the left anterior descending artery 
left bundle branch block sorry left bundle branch it is supplied by the lad means similarly the as we discussed as the right bundle branch is supplied by the lad but yeah, this left bundle branch may get collateral from the right coronary artery and the lcs similarly the left bundle branch as we know it divides into anterior fascicles fascicles and posterior fascicles the anterior fascicle it activates the anterior wall it is supplied by the septal branch of the left anterior uh, descending artery so whenever we get a left anterior fascicular block think of lad similarly uh, it is very sensitive to ischemia because it has a uh, single supply but posterior fascicle has a dual supply it, is, as it activates the inferior and the posterior wall and it is supplied by the right coronary artery and occasionally the septal branch of the left anterior descending and distal distally it is supplied by the anterior and posterior septal branches so we here we see a dual supply here we see as a single artery supply which is dual supply that's why anterior fascicle it is more sensitive to ischemia because of single blood supply coming to the acute coronary syndrome as we know that uh, acute coronary syndrome basically includes a spectrum of the changes that occur due to an acute block changes in the coronary vessels and it is uh, classified into three parts unstable angina non st elevation myocardial infarction and st elevation so whenever we get the patient with chest pain we should label him as a case of acute coronary syndrome it uh, include unstable angina non st elevation mi and st elevation mi not all cases of chest pain if we, if it is a if this is of cardiac origin and uh, uh, how to diagnose that whether the patient is having unstable angina or uh, non st elevation myocardial infarction or infarction or st elevation mi i am uh, going to discuss in the uh, next slides uh, this uh, diagram uh, clearly differentiates the unstable angina from nst mi and stmi in unstable angina we have a non occlusive thrombus in non st elevation mi we have occluding thrombus it is sufficient to cause tissue damage and mild myocardial necrosis here uh, in unstable angina we have a non occlusive blood flow is okay but it has occluding thrombus in non st elevation mi and it can cause tissue damage and in st elevation so is st elevation mi we have a complete thrombus if this is the lumen of the vessel there is a complete thrombus formation and it causes occlusion of the coronary artery in st elevation mi we have a complete thrombus in a non st elevation mi we have a incomplete thrombus but it can cause damage in an unstable angina we have a non occlusive thrombus thrombus is not uh, up to that mark that it can cause occlusion of the blood supply similarly in ecg in unstable angina we will have non specific ecg changes but in non st elevation mi we can have st depression it may or may not be present t wave inversion can be seen in on ecg st depression may or may not be present but t wave depression is present in the ecg similarly in st uh, elevation mi we get st elevation in the ecg or we get a new left bundle branch as i told in my previous uh, lectures that uh, in whenever we get a patient with left bundle branch block or uh, patient with prior new uh, e normal ecg with new lvv we should think of ischemia so new lvv is always suggestive of st elevation mi the cardiac signs in unstable angina they are normal but in non st elevation mi the cardiac signs are elevated and in st elevation mi the cardiac signs are elevated and patient will have more severe symptoms so st elevation mi we will get st elevation in ecg new lvv there will be a complete thrombus occlusion elevated cardiac signs more severe symptoms in non st elevation mi patient will have uh, in this uh, occluding thrombus but it is it can 
this is a partially occlusion of the thrombus uh, occlusion but it can cause tq damage the patient may have s3 depression may or may not be and t wave inversion we can find in ecg and there will be elevated cardiac insurance the cardiac insurance they will be elevated in both st elevation and uh, non st elevation mi so whenever a patient of uh, retro uh, retro sternal chest pain comes to us and we have a suspicion of ischemia uh, ecg findings are also little bit suggestive we do their uh, troponin t level high sensitive troponin t level and uh, tropon cut off point for troponin t level is 14 nanogram per liter if uh, this troponin t level they are less than 14 nanogram per liter mm, we should uh, repeat troponin t level uh, after uh, three hours and thereafter after six hours and uh, if we get uh, significant increase uh, in troponin level uh, then uh, and his symptoms are also suggested then these findings are compatible with the uh, presentation okay and uh, if there is no significant rise in troponin t level after three to six hours then uh, we can think of non-invasive stratification if there is more than a 20 percent increase in troponin t level after three to six hours then it is uh, significant and we should take the patient for pci similarly if the patient comes and his uh, troponin levels are more than 14 nanogram per liter or there is marked increase in troponin level and his uh, presentation is also compatible that is suggestive of heart attack or myocardial infarction then we should think of the patient is having myocardial infarction and we have to treat on the same line that which i will discuss later but if there is only marginal increase means 14 uh, say thoda sa jada hai which is more than uh, it is up to 18 20 then we have again to repeat the test after three to six hours and uh, we have to consider differential diagnosis if there is significant rise after three to six hours then and his presentation is compatible then we should think of myocardial infarction as we know that uh, atherosclerosis is an important cause of myocardial infarction but there are other conditions also in which we get uh, mi and uh, this is the list of these conditions for example if there is oxygen supply demand imbalance as in aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation carbon monoxide poisoning hyperthyroidism prolonged hypotension hypotensive crisis sepsis hypertrophic cardiomyopathy av fistula uh, cocaine overdose endothelial dysfunction we should these can these condition can also cause the uh, myocardial infarction similarly if the patient has coronary embolism in cases of endocarditis whether it, that is infective or non infective mitral valve prolapse intracardiac thrombus prosthetic valve myxoma fibroelastoma valvular calcification patient having arthritis in as seen in syphilis sle takayasu syndrome pan polyarthritis nodosa kawasaki ankylosing spondylitis these patients can have also present with patient of sle and antiphospholipid syndrome these also have a presentation of mi trauma patients less related or hydrogenic radiotherapy contusion infiltrative and proliferative lesions like hurlers homocysteine urea amyloidosis pseudoxanthoma elasticum congenital disorders like coronary fistula coronary aneurysm anomalous coronary origin hematological for example in situ thrombosis hyperviscosity polycythemia is very common thrombocytosis hypercoagulable states antiphospholipid syndrome thrombotic thrombocytopenic perfura dic and other condition like trans metal 
एम आई एंजाइना एटिक डाइसेक्शन कॉर्नरी डाइसेक्शन एज इन प्रेगनेंसी मार्फन एरल सिंड्रोम कोकेन ओवरडोज टोकोस सुबो थ्रोम्बोसिस देन स्पॉन्टेनिस थ्रोम्बोलिस मेडिकेशन माइकार्डियल बेच दीज आर ऑल बेसिक कंडीशन बिच यू शुड नो एंड ई एंड ही दे कैन ऑल्सो कॉज माइकार्डियल इन्फेक्शन इन्फॉक्शन दो इन सच पेशेंट वी मे नॉट हैव एनी एथियोस्क्रोसिस so uh, there are basic differences between sp elevation and my unstable angina or uh, non sp elevation and my in sp elevation and my we have totally occlusive thrombus but in this uh, there is no total occlusion and uh, totally occlusive thrombus it is there is more extensive myocardial damage in here in non sp elevation there is less extensive myocardial damage uh, in sp elevation the entire thickness of the myocardial wall is involved but in non st elevation mi there is involvement of only sub endocardial myocardium because the occlusion persists for long time in st elevation mi it can cause myocardial necrosis uh, we may get uh, small amount of necrosis in non st elevation mi ecg changes there is e st elevation in the in st elevation mi in non st elevation there is st depression it may or may not be present but there is no st elevation Uh, reperfusion therapy in the form of primary percutaneous coronary intervention or uh, thrombolytic therapy it is a mainstay of treatment in st elevation mi but in non st elevation mi we have early invasive strategy that is uh, percutaneous coronary intervention for those patient who are at high risk these risk stratification i will discuss in my next slides I, uh, uh, we will see how the ischemia affects the ECG changes. So suppose this is the subendocardial ischemia. As we know, subendocardial ischemia is seen in the uh, non-ST elevation MI, and uh, this is the subepicardial ischemia. This is subendocardial ischemia. Here uh, we can see this is the part which is injured, or we can say undergoing necrosis. Uh, in subendocardial ischemia, uh, as we see, this is the injured side. The electrical activity uh, will be like this. Means uh, in this direction, as it appears, as this injured side is calling for help. Uh, this uh, happens during the diastole. Diastole is represented by the TP segment, and this TP segment, if you see here. This is actually a baseline, and uh, since we know that uh, the direction of vector is like this, uh, it will elevate the baseline. And the ST segments, however, the ST segments remain unaffected. And uh, so, and this hole will appear as elevated, and the ST segment will remain at its position, and it will appear as ST depression. So, in as uh, this. sub endocardial ischemia uh, because of necrosis this portion will get, uh, get elevated means there is elevation but the st segment will remain at its at its own position and it will appear as a depression that's why we get st depression and in the uh, non st elevation mi uh, basically there is elevation of Uh, this portion because of necrosis and it gives the appearance of st depression so in uh, sub epicardial ischemia the direction of uh, current is like this and uh, since uh, this is the lead placement uh, because of uh, direction, opposite direction of the uh, current we will get downward shift of this whole portion But the ST segment will remain at its own position, and uh, because of down downward uh, shifting of uh, uh, this uh, segment, we will get the feeling that there is ST elevation. That's why we get the uh, ST elevation in ST elevation in the subepicardial ischemia or transmural ischemia. I hope uh, I am able to make you understand. If uh, I am not able uh, to make you understand, just I remember this thing whenever there is a subendocardial 
स्कीम में जैसा बाइड्रोकार्टिल स्कीम में वी ऑलवेज गेस एस दी डिप्रेशन एंड वेन एवर देर इज सब एपिकार्डियल स्कीमिया वी गेट एस दी सेगमेंटल एलिवेशन मीन सब एपिकार्डियल स्कीमिया और ट्रांसम्यूरल स्कीमिया वी गेट एस दी एलिवेशन एंड इन सब एंड्रोकार्डियल स्कीमिया वी गेट एस दी डिप्रेशन Here in this, uh, this is the subendocardial ischemia. We get ST depression, and here this is the transmural ischemia, or we can say epicardial ischemia. So epicardial ischemia we get ST segment, uh, ST elevation. Uh, whenever a patient of uh, MI or ischemia uh, comes to us, this is about the normal baseline ECG. First uh, changes which are seen. Within few minutes, are the hyperacute T waves. Uh, these are the hyperacute T waves. When do we say hyperacute T waves? The hyperacute T waves are basically tall, tented T waves. And the when T wave uh, in amplitude is more than two third of the R wave, or we can say uh, it is more than 10 to 15 mm tall, then we say it is a hyperacute uh, T wave. This uh, T wave, it is if it is more than 10 millimeter, means more than 10 small sphere in the limb leads and more than 15 small sphere uh, in the precordial leads, then we call it as a hyperacute T wave. After the formation of hyperacute T waves, uh, within minutes to hours, we get progressive ST segment elevation. Here we can see the ST segment. Elevation. After the STS segment uh, elevation, uh, hours to days, uh, we get the Q wave formation. The Q wave formation uh, usually occurs 8 to 12, 12 hours after the uh, onset of the MI. So, this uh, we should uh, remember that whenever there is Q wave formation, uh, then the, we should think that the ischemia has happened. For the last 8 to 12 hours. Uh, after the Q wave formation, uh, the R waves are uh, with the formation of Q wave, the R waves are also uh, lost and we get a T wave inversion in days, uh, various uh, days, and then after days and weeks or months, we can say the normal QRS complexes we get with the formation of the Q wave. Okay. One thing uh, we should remember that all ST elevations are not always acute myocardial infarction. There is a mnemonic for causes of ST elevation. It can be remembered as a elevation. E stands for electrolytes. That is whenever there is electrolyte disturbance, for example, hyperkalemia. L is for left bundle branch block. E is for early repolarization, that is a benign early repolarization. B is for ventricular hypertrophy. A is for arrhythmias like Brugada or ventricular tachycardia, aneurysm of the left ventricle, aortic dissections. T is for tocosubo disease. Traumatic brain injury, for example, in the patients of raised IS, ICH, we can also have ST elevation. Then we have infarction or any injury, inflammation, that is whether myo or pericarditis. Then we have Osborne waves as seen in hypothermia or hypercalcemia. Uh, N is for the non atherosclerotic vasospasm, like in quince metals and China. And other conditions which I already mentioned. Uh, when do we say that ST elevation is uh, significant and uh, for uh, MI? Uh, ST elevation means any new ST elevation at the J point in two contiguous leads with the cutoff point, for example, if it is more than equal to 1 mm. In all leads other than V2 and V3, means in the limb leads like lead 1, 2, 3, 
AVR, AVN, AVF. If the ST elevation at the J point is more than equal to 1 mm, but these they should be contiguous. Contiguous means like uh, let we know lateral leads. The leads which see the heart from the same direction. For example, lateral leads, uh, lateral leads are lead 1, AVL, uh, lead V5, and V6. The changes should be ST elevation should be present in these leads. Similarly, if we have inferior leads, like uh, inferior leads are lead 2, 3, AVF. Similarly, we have uh, if we have changes in uh, septal leads like lead 1, B1 and B2 and anterior leads like V3, B4 and V5 or B3, B4. So the, these are the contiguous leads. The leads which see the heart from the same direction, these are the contiguous leads. So in limb leads like lead 1, lead 2, 3, ABF, if inferior leads, Later leads like lead 1, AVL, V5, V6. The ST elevation at the J point should be more than equal to 1 mm. But in lead V2 and V3, V2 and V3, if we get ST elevation, the cutoff points are different. They should be more than equal to 2 mm in men with the age more than equal to 40 years and in young men like who are less than 40 years, the ST elevation criteria is more than equal to 2.5. So in men, in V2, V3, we have age uh, dependency, like if they are uh, more than 40 years of age, the ST elevation should be more than 2 mm. And if they are less than 40 years of age, the ST elevation should be equal to or more than 2.5 mm. But in women, and there is no age criteria, the ST elevation in V2, V3 is kept as more than equal to 1.5 mm regardless of their age. Similarly, for ST depression and T wave changes, if we get new horizontal or down sloping ST depression, new horizontal or down sloping ST depression of more than equal to 0.5 mm in any two contiguous leads and or T inversion in more than 1 mm in two contiguous leads with prominent R wave or R by S ratio of more than 1. These are the criteria for ST depression and the T wave changes. These guidelines are taken from the American Cardiac uh, Cardiac Society, European Society of Cardiology, American Heart Association of uh, 2018. So, suppose this is anterior wall MI, we will get the changes in the V3 and V4. And uh, this is the septal wall MI, we will get that ECG changes in lead V1 and V2. For uh, lateral leads, like this is the lateral wall MI, this is lateral, we will get changes in the lead 1, EVL, V5 and V6. And uh, this is the inferior wall MI. We will get changes in the inferior leaf like lead 2, 3, and AVF. I hope it is clear. So, as we have already discussed, this is the position of the leaves, and this is the lead 1, this is lead AVL. They see the heart from the lateral side, we lead 2, 3, AVF. They see heart from, from the inferior side, and AVR see the heart from the uh, right side, and this is the uh, how V1. V2, they see the septum, V3, V4, they see the anterior part of the heart, V5 and V6, they see the heart from the lateral side. I hope it is clear and I have already mentioned this. To label a patient with uh, MI, if we are getting SE elevation in uh, inferior lead, for example, in this figure, so we must get reciprocal changes, means ST depression in the and their opposite leads like if this is heart and we get ST elevation in lead 3, AVF and lead 2, 
this is lead one avl so if we are getting changes so then we will get the uh, reciprocal changes in the opposite uh, for example this is st elevation lead two lead three and lead abf then we should get st depression in lead one v5 and lead one avl and the uh, v5 and v6 this is v5 and v6 okay i hope it is understood if we see this ecg we find st elevation lead to lead 3 avf and uh, also st elevation lead uh, v5 and v6 so it is the anterior uh, lateral wall mi here we also see st depression in lead v1 v2 also and uh, in fact avr also so it is uh, inferior wall is involved posterior wall is involved also the lateral wall is also involved so we can say it is inferior posterior lateral wall in my just remember one thing that if we have isoelectric lead one lead one is almost flat uh, that indicates and cx occlusion also LCX occlusion also indicates uh, also indicates posterior wall MI. For LCX occlusion, always look at lead one. If it shows ST depression, then it is RCA occlusion. Um, and if it is isoelectric, then this is a LCX occlusion. Means lead one. If it is if it shows ST depression, then it is RCA occlusion. And if it is isoelectric, then it shows LCX occlusion. Here we, if we see that uh, ST elevation is there in lead 1 and uh, lead AVL, we get ST depression in lead 2, 3, and also in AVF. So if we see, and then there is also ST elevation in lead V1 and V2. Uh, so lead 1 AVL, but in V5 and V6, uh, we don't have any ST elevation. So it is suggestive of later wall MI. As we know, the lateral wall is spread by the LCX, left circumflex artery. So the reason is, uh, the main reason is the occlusion of the left circumflex artery. We don't find ST elevation in V5 and V6. Only lead 1 and lead AVL. In only these two leads, we get ST elevation plus V1, V2 is here. So the, when only lead 1 and AVL are involved, we call it as high lateral wall MI, high lateral wall MI. If, we, if, we, if there is involvement of V5 and V6 also, V5 and V6 is also involved, we, we call it as low lateral wall MI. Here we can see uh, we have ST elevation in lead 1, sorry, lead V1, V2, and V3. And we have ST depression in lead 2, uh, lead 3, AVF, and also in V5 and V6. So it is a sort of uh, anterior sector MI. We have very tall T waves here. So once again, we can see the criteria for ST elevation in male more less than 40, male more than 40, and female of any age. Uh, the ST elevation in V2 or V3 uh, in contiguous leads, it should be more than 2.5 mm if the patient is less than 40 years old, means younger age patient. 
and uh, a patient uh, is male patient with four, more than 40 years of age the three elevation of 2 mm or more it is uh, it will suggest us the patient has mi but in females the criteria is only for 1.5 mm but in other leaves the criteria is st elevation of more than 1 mm it is suggestive of mi if we get st elevation of more than 1 mm in limb leaves or other leaves just leaves like v3 v5 v6 v4 we have various condition uh, which we call them as a st stemi equivalence means if we get these findings in an ecg uh, we should think of st elevation and my this is the conventional st, uh, ST elevation and my so there is st elevation at the j point and similarly we have another condition called d winters syndrome uh, in d winters syndrome we have j point depression and up sloping st segment depression in v1 to v6 up sloping st depression in v1 this is up sloping st depression in v1 to v6 that continues into tall positive symmetrical t wave often with 1 to milli, 1 to 2 millimeter st elevation in avr so in d winter syndrome we have j point depression and up sloping of the st segment depression in v1 to v6 that continues into tall positive symmetrical t waves often with 1 to 2 millimeter st elevation in the avr similarly posterior st elevation mi whenever there is st depression of more than equal to 0 0.05 millivolt horizontal or down sloping or concave in v1 vr v1 to v3 means v1 v2 v3 uh, even v4 and there is a tall r wave in v1 and v2 with the rs ratio of more than 1 in v2 tall r wave we get in the v1 or v2 with rs ratio of more than 1 in lead v2 then it is suggestive of posterior st elevation and my and then we have valence uh, a and valence b in valence a we get biphasic anterior t waves that not always accompanied by the chest such patient don't have any chest pain but we get biphasic anterior t waves here we see the t wave is half it is elevated and, and then there is downward sloping this is we call y facing anterior t wave and such patient may or may not have may not have a chest pain then in case of valence d we have deeply inverted t waves and uh, they are deeply inverted t wave then we have hyper acute t waves when do we say hyper acute these are tall t waves often symmetrical broad base means base is very broad and uh, they are often associated with reciprocal ST depression and uh, we have reciprocal ST depression in other leaves the tall T waves these are hyper acute T waves these are also suggestive of acute MI then we have left bundle branch blocks uh, where uh, we have Garbosa's criteria for labeling it as a uh, LBB with ischemic changes. And we have Garboza criteria 1, Garboza criteria 2, Garboza criteria 3, or we call it as a modified criteria. In Garboza criteria 1, there is ST elevation. This is ST elevation of more than 0.1 millivolt, means more than one small scale, concordant to the QRS in any of the lead, lead 1, AVL, V4 to V6. As we know that concordance means direction of the T wave and the direction of the preceding wave is in the same direction. 
and uh, if we get such findings these are suggestive of ischemia so this garbosa criteria one is given five points then we have garbosa criteria two here the st depression this is the st depression of more than 0.1 millivolt more than equal to 0.1 millivolt concordant means same direction this is st depression same direction preceding wave same direction in any of the lead from p1 to v3 and uh, then we have garbosa criteria 3 we call it as a modified criteria when we get st elevation with amplitude of more than 25 percent of the depth of the preceding s wave here we see the amplitude of more than st elevation this is st elevation with amplitude of more than 25 percent of the depth of the preceding s wave and this quadrant qrs complexes qrs discordant means the p wave and the preceding wave or the qrs they are in the inversely opposite uh, directions in p1 to v3 but this is given two points if we get these uh, findings in an ecg with lvv we should think of ischemia then we have a sharp thin appearance this, if we see this is uh, this appearance is like a sharp and uh, if we get such changes in ecg so we should think of ischemia j point transitioning in the convex st segment and t wave indistinguishable from the st segment due to extreme st deviation where we cannot easily distinguish the uh, t wave but this is the whole of the st segment uh, giving the appearance of a sharp pin then we have acute ischemia and left ventricular hypertrophy the st elevation st elevation is more than 25 percent of the qrs amplitude in three contiguous leads okay more than 25 percent of the qrs and st elevation is in the three contiguous leads or t wave inversion in the anterior leads and t wave inversion in the anterior leads are v3 and v4 so these are the these are the few st elevation mi equivalents and whenever we, we get uh, such patients with these ecg findings we should think of ischemia and we have to treat as per as we treat the st elevation mi we have garbosa smith modification also here we take uh, the ratio of r and s wave in the leads with discordance and uh, we have to take the absolute size of the st deviation and uh, if the deviation that is r or s deviation divided by r or s is more than 25.25 in any of the lead then the uh, garbosa is positive that means here we can see this is the uh, us complex enemy for example and this is the st segment depression we have to take the ratio of this okay 3 upon 10 this is the st depression this is the deviation divided by r or s wave this is r or s wave and if it is more than 0.25 similarly here also uh, this is the st this is the st elevation and this is the us complex or we can say rrs wave so we have to take its ratio and if it is more than 0.25 then if these findings are suggestive of um, ischemia and left frontal branch block so coming to the treatment part and before going to the treatment part let's see also deep interest phenomena what happens in deep interest phenomena uh, the diagnostic features are the precordial junctional st segment depression this is the st this is the j point st segment depression at the j point 1 to 3 mm in lead b1 to v6 if we see this is the s wave and this is the st segment depression this 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 is the st segment depression uh, which is more than 1 mm 
in leads V1 to V6, then we have tall peaked symmetrical T waves in the precording leads. These are the tall symmetrical T wave, uh, T wave. We call them call them as hyperacute uh, T waves or rocketing T waves in the precording leads. Then we have lead AVR that shows the slight ST segment elevation in most cases and it is more than 0.5 mm. If these findings we get an NECG, then we should think of D winters uh, phenomena or D winters T uh, waves and it is STME equivalent and we have to treat it as same as as we treat the ST elevation MI that is uh, we require emergent PCI or thrombolysis. In balance, uh, what we get? Uh, we get biphasic T waves in V2 or V3. Biphasic T wave. If we see the direction of the T wave is initially uh, positive, then it becomes negative. Biphasic T wave in V2 and V3. And this is highly specific for critical stenosis of the left anterior descending artery. And such patient may present with may not present with the pain. They may be pain free. Okay. The biphasic T wave in V2 and V3, we should think of left anterior descending artery occlusion and treatment is uh, analgesia, serial ECG, and such patients should undergo cardiology review. This was about type A. In type B, we get symmetrical, deep and symmetrical T wave in more than 75% of the cases. So this is well and A, we get a symmetrical, uh, sorry, biphasic uh, T wave. Uh, initially it is up sloping, then it is T wave inversion in uh, balance B, we get deep T wave, symmetrical T waves. So uh, coming to the treatment part, whenever any patient comes with the chest pain and uh, when he reports to any doctor or paramedics uh, this is called uh, first uh, mail contact first medical contact whenever he reports we have to do urgent ECG and within 10 minutes if we find that the patient is having ST elevation MI. Then, if we know that there is a hospital where the facility for PCI means Parkinson's coronary interventions are available, and if we have to shift that patient to that center, and there is if there is a delay of less than 120 minute is less than two hours then when he, when when then we can send him to there for pci but if we know that patient with st elevation mi and uh, if we have to shift the patient to the center where the pci is available but the time for P, time to reach there is more than two hours then we should opt for fibrolysis means thrombolysis so if the we can shift the patient within two hours after the diagnosis of st elevation mi to a primary to the center where pci is available which means angioplasty can be done then we should we should shift if we know that the pci center is not available in the reach of two hours if there is a if there will be a delay of more than two hours then it is better to send the patient to uh, do the patients fibrinolysis or thrombolysis. So, uh, if we uh, do the fibrinolysis, then we can send the patient for further PCI if there are uh, profusion defects. Or, uh, I mean to say that when the facility for PCI is will be delayed by more than two hours, then we have to do, do the fibrinolysis, or we can say we can we have to do thrombolysis, and thereafter we can send the patient for, for PCI to the next center after stabilizing the patient. So the crucial period for the diagnosis 
crucial period for the treatment after the diagnosis is 2 hours if the PCI center is available and the patient can be there within 2 hours means less than 120 minutes then we can send him to the father PCI but if we know that there will be delay by more than 2 hours then we have to first do his fibrinolysis then thereafter after stabilizing the patient we can send him the how will we come to know that the patient has responded to thrombolysis uh, it will be uh, the patient will have uh, improvement in the symptoms the ecg changes will revert back and the patient will show a reperfusion arrhythmias these are the three things by which we can say that the there is uh, the patient has effective thrombolysis improvement in the symptom the reperfusion arrhythmias and the uh, the st uh, the st changes which were initially showing elevation they come back to normal before uh, uh, doing the thrombolysis the primary pci if the patient reports to any medical officer then he has to after confirming the diagnosis of st elevation mi uh, or an st elevation mi uh, initially we have to give the aspirin in a dose of 325 milligram but this aspirin should not be entirely coated it should be the preparation which can be easily chewable means uh, chewable preparation of the aspirin uh, we have to give the chewable aspirin that is like disprin we can give it has to be chewed as a whole means 325 milligram it should be the static dose and it should be chewed secondly we can give clopidogrel the loading dose is 600 milligram orally then thereafter the we can give maintenance dose of uh, 75 milligram per day similarly we have to give atorvastatin 80 milligram stat atorvast 80 milligram stat these three drugs aspirin clopidogrel atorvast they should be given to every patient of uh, ST elevation MI or uh, ST elevation MI or NST elevation MI irrespective before the before sending the patient for PCI or thrombolysis. Uh, there are other drugs. Uh, we can also give prosugrel, then we have uh, ticagrel, F60 map, FTP metal, tiropagan, depending on the availability. So uh, for uh, Thrombolysis, the fibrolytic agents or antithrombotic agents which are available, which can be used are these uh, streptokinase, altaplase, ratiplase, tenectiplase. These are the doses given. The streptokinase can be given as uh, 1.5 million units and dissolve in dextrose 5% or NS and it can be given over 1 hour. Okay. And uh, similarly, alteplase, ratiplase, and triplase can be given as the dose mentioned against each. And the, the patient uh, will respond to uh, this streptokinase or fibrinolytic therapy. Uh, his chest pain will improve. The STE changes will revert back, and the patient will have reperfusion arrhythmias, as I already discussed. But uh, uh, the all patient cannot be given these fibrinolytic agents. There are certain contraindications to the fibrinolytic therapy. These include the pre, these are the absolute contraindication like previous intracranial hemorrhage or stroke of unknown origin, ischemic stroke in the preceding six months, CNS damage or neoplasm or arterial venous malformation, recent major trauma, surgery, head injury, gastrointestinal bleeding within the past month patient is having any bleeding disorders but it should exclude the menses patient with the history of aortic dissection non compressible punctures in past 24 hours for 24 hours for example liver biopsy number punctured and such patient we should preferably preferably do pci and we should avoid fibrinolytic therapy um, with the fibrinolytic therapy, we can also give anticoagulation 
the anticoagulation is recommended in patients who are treated with uh, fibrinolytics until the revascularization if performed before the PCI or the duration of the hospital stay is up to 8 days. So if uh, we, are, we have done fibrinolysis and, uh, and the revascularization is planned, that is PCI is planned, uh, till that time we can also give anticoagulants and also we can give uh, uh, these anticoagulants for a duration of 8 days during the hospital stay. The anticoagulants which are most commonly used are enoxaprin that is uh, we call it as a low molecular weight heparin or we can give ultrafil uh, this uh, ultra filtered hyper heparin and uh, the patient who are treated with streptokinase pontoparinex in IV bolus by subcutaneous dose 24 hours later can be given after doing the fibrinolysis, we have to shift the patient to PCI capable center. Following uh, this, uh, uh, all such patients should be should undergo uh, PCI or at least the coronary angiography to rule out whether the uh, reperfusion is complete or such patient required fibrinolysis or not. Sorry, PCI or not. The non patient with non ST elevation MI. Uh, they should also undergo PCI depending upon the risk involved and uh, such patients are categorized into very high risk, high risk and intermediate risk. The high risk are the patient with uh, hemodynamic instability or cardiogenic shock, recurrent ongoing chest pain, refractive to medical treatment, life-threatening arrhythmias or cardiac arrest, mechanical complications of the MI, acute heart failure, recurrent uh, dynamic STT, ST or T weight changes. They should immediately undergo PCI within two hours. And if the patients are high risk, for example, patient has established diagnosis of non-ST elevation myocardial infarction based on the cardiac troponins, dynamic ST. A patients of non-ST elevation MI, they are they also undergo PCI. Uh, they are the they are initially categorized to very high risk, high risk and intermediate risk. The patients who are uh, high risk, like him, patients with hemodynamic instability or cardiogenic shock, the recurrent or ongoing chest pain, ongoing chest pain, refractory to medical treatment, life threatening arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, mechanical complications of MI, acute heart failure, or recurrent uh, dynamic ST T wave changes, they should undergo immediate invasive PCI within two hours. Patients with high risk, like as we, those who have established diagnosis of non ST elevation MI, depending on the cardiac, raised to cardiac troponins, dynamic STT wave changes, symptomatic patients are silent with a gray score of more than 120, 140. They should undergo uh, <coughs> this PCI within less than 24 hours. And this is also class 1A indication. And the patients with the intermediate risk. Like uh, patients with diabetes mellitus or renal insufficiency, left ventricular ejection fraction less than 40% or congestive cardiac failure. Patients with history of early post infarction angina or prior PCI or CAVG. And patients with grace risk score of more than 109 or less than 140 or recurrent uh, symptoms or ischemia or non invasive testing, they also undergo, they should also undergo PCI within 72 hours. I hope uh, how to diagnose acute coronary syndrome or we can say non-ST elevation MI or ST elevation MI in an ECG with the typical presentation presentation by the patient and its management like the role of thrombolysis and the role of PCI when to do thrombolysis and when to do PCI uh, is clear now. And if still you have any doubt, you can read standard textbook uh, like uh, Harrison uh, for more detailed information on acute coronary syndrome or we can say 